All right. Um, thank you very much. So I'm uh, uh, the theorist here. So I'm the reason why Yao had to apologize on, on, on behalf of the organizer for the equations. So I think, I think it's not going to be particularly painful. Uh, there's going to be a couple of equations, but it's not, it's not going to be too bad, I hope. I hope. So, but, 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 um, uh, so what I'm going to try and do is I'm going to talk about, you know, um, a kind of a relatively recent um, last 10 years uh, field um, in economics, which uh, uses um, some of the stuff we've been talking about today, so uh, the concepts of cultures and, and institutions, and try to put them in a, in a, in a, uh, in a setup to think about economic growth, okay? Um, and so I'm going to do, I'm, I'm going to do, about, I'm going to talk a little bit about my work, but I'm also trying to, I'm also going to try to, um, you know, introduce generally the kind of way we think about the economy, by we I mean economists, Economists think about these things and the, and the way and the kind of data uh, uh, that they use. Okay, so uh, let me start. Okay, so I didn't know Paul was here. I was congratulating uh, the whole field. Um, uh, now I'm congratulating him. I'm very happy. So for his, for his prize. So the growth theory. So of course growth theory is, is old in economics, but um, the endogenous part of the growth theory, the one for which Paul was awarded the Nobel Prize. Um, uh, so, I, I, I try, so I'm trying to start from there and, 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 and introducing what uh, people have, have been doing in the last uh, 10 years. So this is, uh, this is uh, so the, the fundamental papers here are in the late 80s, okay? So um, the questions are the fundamental question, you can argue are the, between the most fundamental question in economics, uh, which is what accounts for economic growth, and another way to ask the same question is what accounts for income heterogeneity across countries, right? So there are... Uh, countries which are rich because they've grown a lot and countries which are not very rich or, or they're poor because they haven't grown a lot, okay? Um, so in this sense, the two questions are the same. And so the way this question was, uh, you know, the, the, the fundamental question that this literature, uh, you know, solved or pushed or, or made us think about is, you know, um, I'm not, of course, I'm not going to get into the economics, but the standard growth model that we had, we're thinking about, you know, um, explaining growth of income in terms of capital, uh, growth of capital, growth of labor, um, of population, okay? And, and, and pretty quickly we understood that those models were not going to do it, okay? So uh, that they could, not, uh, they could not explain constant growth. And so we went into, you know, in some sense, this literature were was talking about a concept, a, if you wish, a made-up concept, total factor productivity, and we were saying, okay, that's the thing which is growing, right? So we don't really know what that is. So endogenous, literature, endogenous growth gets to the heart of what is this total factor productivity that is growing and it's causing uh, the growth of income, okay? Um, and, you know, um, technological growth, technological innovation, R&D, human capital, there's all sorts of stuff that... Uh, people started, again, in the late 80s to think and to put into the models to try and understand work. And one of the things that, again, Paul did um, was to think about, you know, what economists call externalities. Um, uh, one uh, example that people looked at is, for instance, urban agglomeration, okay? So this idea that cities grow, uh, cities are crucial for the growth of countries, um, people in cities meet, and something happens when, you know, they agglomerate into city that makes uh, things grow better, okay? Growth of ideas, uh, the, the uh, development of ideas, and things of this sort, okay? So that's where, in some sense, um, uh, we were uh, at, some, at some level in, in the 80s, okay? So now, more recently, and late 80s, 90s, of course, these are still things that we keep doing, obviously. Um, so the literature and economics kind of way to, to think about, the way we think about growth is a little bit changed. Um, and I mean, not changed, you know, it's, in some sense, we're still looking at uh, what's that A, what's that total factor, the A in the equation, the total factor of productivity, but people have looked, have looked at the question in a completely different way, in a sense, in the last 10 years. Huh? Some, um, so the fundamental names here are Daron Semoglu, Jim Robinson, and others. Um, so I'm just saying those names, just to make sure, to make sure I'm not claiming it's me, obviously. Okay, so, um, the questions are exactly the same, but they look at this question in a completely different way. So they look at the, at the question in terms of, they look at, if you wish, they would, I think they would claim or we would claim, um, they look at, 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 at 
somewhat deeper level uh, in terms of factors, but deeper also means vague, more vague, less, you know, less easy to identify, less easy to think about, less easy to model. So in fact, there is very little, mod there is very little modeling um, in this world, in this uh, you know, new, um, I call it new economics of institution because that's typically the way this is called, uh, but we could call it new, new economic growth or whatever. In any case, so um, the idea here is that typically people try and find the origin, where growth or where economic prosperity comes from, and they look for a single origin. And typically, a lot of these questions are, is it culture or is it, or is it institutions? Okay, so somehow in the last 10 years we've been uh, doing, or maybe even more so, more than 10 years, we've been really playing on this question. Is it culture or is it institutions? And of course, you know, you first have to define what these two things, and the definition is a little, as I said, blurred and vague, right? So some of the answers, I say, including institutions, people talk about history, uh, geography, and other issues. I'm going to uh, concentrate on the distinction between culture and institution today. But of course, could be, we could do more than that. Okay, so how do you do this? So which kind of a, uh, even data, if you wish, or which kind of a mechanism you use to try uh, methodological mechanism you use to try and identify is it culture or is it institution, right? So typically what you do is do things like historical natural experiments. Um, the idea here is you look in history and you try and see a situation where institution changed. Uh, they have to be, they have to change exogenously and then, you know, um, that's a thing that um, economists are, are, are very careful about, typically very careful, and this literature is very careful about. So the idea is think about a situation where institution changed for some exogenous reason, um, and 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 a situ the, the situation has to be the, the 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 experiment, the historical experiment has to be one where institution changed, but culture didn't, and a bunch of other stuff did. Okay, and and so then if you see that example, then you say ah, it's being institutions. They changed, culture didn't, and it went right. So, but what do we mean by? institution change and culture didn't, we mean at the moment where the shock is. Of course, uh, so in some sense we're looking at the origin again, right? So institution change in a particular instance, and in that particular instance co uh, culture didn't, but then of course over, over uh, years and centuries, these lit literature typically look at historical data, very long run historical data, then uh, both kind of change, okay? So there are many examples, there's some, again, very famous in economics, uh, which have to do, as uh, Samoglon Robinson, which have to do um, uh, with, uh, with uh, you know, the change in institution due to uh, the arrival of colonial empires um, in, in the world, okay? Um, and, and of course, colonial empires are not exogenous, and, but, you know, uh, these people have, have been very careful. Uh, of course, there's a lot of debate, but they, they at least try to be very careful in identifying exogenous changes, right? So the idea here is, you know, uh, so the story, the standard story here, um, people who think that institutions are crucial, the standard story is, um, um, uh, so in some instances, colonial empires, uh, or, in, or in general, for some other reason, um, uh, institutions which are more inclusive, which are less extractive of the population, are, you know, come about, and when this happens, uh, great things happen, okay? So the countries start growing, and things are good, okay? Uh, so, of course, this is a simplification of, of the whole story, but that's kind of the idea behind, okay? So there are many examples uh, in different ways, okay? Of course, there are people who have done uh, or have thought of doing uh, the same kind of argument with culture. So where the idea is, okay, it's culture changed, uh, but the institution didn't, and we see thing, wonderful things happen. Okay, so the typical, at least um, intellectual experiment, not that. Uh, not, so the literature on institution has been very careful statistical, statistically. Uh, the literature which claims that it's all culture, it's been a little bit less uh, careful statistically, I would want to claim. Um, but, so, but the standard example is, of course, uh, the protest that, Protestant ethic, right? So the idea there is, of course, there's no exogenity. We're not really claiming exogeneity. We should, but the idea here is, you know, there's a cultural change. Um, uh, you know, Christianity breaks into, pe in, into two, two pieces, and for some reason, you know, intellectual, cultural reason, the Protestants are doing better, okay? And then 
countries which are Protestant gr grow faster and wonderful things happen. Of course, in the course of these wonderful things happening, institution change too. But the idea, if this you know, theory or hypothesis is correct, of course, here is the changes in, in, in culture first, and, it, and that's the causal mechanism. Okay? So the crucial thing here, it's all causal. Now, I want to claim, I want to argue, in both cases, it's important that we are le what's happening here is we are looking at typically, uh, statistically, at two moments in time. We're looking at something happening a long time ago, and we look at and we correlate that um, with something now, which is the level of prosperity, the level of income, and things of this sort now. Okay, so we're not really looking at the whole dynamics that much, in part because there is no data, in part because we might not want to. The idea here is we want to identify a causal effect uh, from one to the other. Okay, um, so I, ju I was just shown the 10 minutes. I thought, uh, okay, uh, Raquel did too long an introduction, but this, <laughs> I think I'm doing worse. Okay, um, so, uh, so, okay, so what am I going to argue in, in, the, in the next 10 minutes? Um, unless the norm of eating up uh, time from the questions uh, is, is established. Uh, so, so the, 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 what I'm going to argue is that uh, one way to, so that this literature is very important and that maybe we should not care too much about co the causation argument. Maybe, you know, in the end, what started first? Did the institution start the process or did culture start the process? Maybe we don't really care very much. These are not policy variables in any case, typically. It's not that you can actually go down and, you can maybe, but you know, of course, it's not a direct policy, so it's not very easy to change institutions, not very easy to change culture. Let's try and better understand the mechanism, okay? So if that's the case, then you know what matters is really the interaction between policy and institution, I want to argue, right? So then what we care about is uh, looking, at the, looking at how the institu institutions, uh, you know, which kind of, ch even if the change is started with institution, which kind of effect did the change in institution had on culture and, and whether the fact that the institution had a change and an effect on culture, whether this effect in fact reinforces or goes in the opposite way with respect to the effect of institution, okay? So in some sense, this is the crucial argument. In, 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 in economics speak, we can, we can think of a cultural multiplier. I'm gonna maybe not get to it at the end, right? So it's the idea that you can think that institution are the cause, but then Culture multiplies the effect of institution over time, okay? If that's the case, then you know it's important to understand the size of this, of this multiplier, okay? Of course, it could go the other way. It could be culture starting and institution having a multiplier. So if these two things multiply in a positive way, that might be a very important effect to try and identify, okay? Um, if they go the other way, if, uh, you know, once you have a change in institution, culture goes against you, then it's important because it means, you know, it's important to try and understand that that means that the effect in institution, the effect of institution actually is smaller um, than it would have been without the effect in culture. Okay, so uh, this interaction of culture and institution, I have a bunch of uh, quotes. This is, of course, the one I like is the one by the Italian, um, uh, Machiavelli. Uh, so, uh, there's, you know, People thought about this, of course, uh, so it's in Italian, but it, so translated in English as, you know, this was a good institutional order when citizens were good, but when citizens became bad, it turned into a horrible order, okay? So um, he was talking about Florence, but apart from this, um, the, whole, uh, the whole idea here is, you know, you need character, values, things, uh, the, the good culture that, that uh, uh, we were talking about before, that Bill was talking about before, you need that together with good institution and you know, then you need to make them interact in a positive way, okay? Um, so that's the idea. Okay, so now I'll have about five minutes. So um, the point, so there's two points. So what, the, what I have is a paper where we do, we write down, uh, oh, by the way, I haven't said this, this is with Thierry Verdier, who's my co-author for many, many years. Uh, from PSC in France. Um, so what we have here is uh, we have a theoretical model where we you know, identify and we abstract from a lot of very interesting stuff, um, possibly not all, and we identify a way in, uh, so we define clearly what we mean by institution, we define clearly what we mean by, uh, I think clearly, what we mean by culture, 
And then, you know, we, we, uh, we think about how these two things change. Institution can change over time, over long run. We have in mind the long run. So we look at how institution and culture change over time and how, you know, this change interact. It, it's, in, it's an interaction, okay? Um, so we write down a mathematical model like uh, economists like to do, uh, and then we look at the properties of this model. Okay, so of course I, I, I already knew that I wasn't gonna talk about the model and, and, and rightly so people don't care here, but um, let me try and give an, a sense of how we model this and, and, and what are the important uh, points I think to take away. So one point I already said, uh, we want to, uh, we think, um, we want to shift the focus from the causation question to the interaction question. We think uh, we don't have any yet um, any empirical work, so we don't have a measure in any particular instance of this cultural multiplier, but we think that would be important, okay? That would be important in, uh, that was 10 minutes ago, five minutes ago. Thank you, fantastic. Okay, so I got, I got five minutes. Um, thank you. <laughs> so, so uh, okay, so I can talk a little bit slower. Um, uh, and I can show a couple of extra equations. <laughs> That's all it. Okay, so the, fir the first thing we want to say, we want to do here is, in some sense, methodological, is to shift the focus from causation to the interaction, and this I already said many times. The second point is we write down a dynamic model which has prediction. I mean, this is very abstract, so you'll have to, our model is very abstract, but possibly once you, you know, put it, put it into use in specific historical inst instances, uh, this model will have prediction about the whole dynamics of cultural institution, not just the beginning at the end, okay? And so we think, um, and that's one of the reasons why we wrote this, um, we think that it'd be important to try and fit data to the, in the middle, okay? So there's all sorts of stuff um, that uh, the mechanism um, so it, 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 there's also, it's really very, very important, especially if you think about policy at some level in some form, to understand the mechanism um, uh, that, that, that leads from some change to, okay. And so to understand the mechanism, you know, we have a model which implies some sort of a mechanism. To understand if this works, you need to put data in the middle, okay? So beginning and the end is not, so, is not necessary. Obviously, it's the first thing, and, and often we don't have that much data, but there's a lot of effort these days. That's the last point, the other point I want to make. There's a lot of effort these days to collect in intelligent, statistically usable ways historical data, okay? So in some sense, um, the, or this paper, this paper you know, built on something which has happened in economics, which is a sort of a, uh, you know, some people, of course, we overuse these terms, but this revolution. Um, so at some point, historians have started um, to use economic models. This is called cleometric revolution, right? In the 80s, I guess, or the 90s. So some economists would say they started mi misusing economic models. Uh, so what, what happens now is that economists are misusing historical data, okay? So there's a lot of historical data out there. We are trying to understand it. Very often economists don't understand it so much, so well, but again, uh, it's progress, okay? So, all right, so 10 minutes. Uh, so the, so there's, a, there's a bunch of, uh, as I said, I don't, I'm not an historian, um, and I don't have, I work with historians, but I'm not an historian, and, and I don't have, I'm not gonna talk about any specific um, historical events or historical phenomenon, but, there are, but there's a lot of, I mean, a lot. There's quite a few very interesting, you know, historical phenomena that historians, questions and issues that historians think about that to my reading, uh, uh, to others people reading, uh, sound like um, interesting uh, instances of this, of this uh, interaction, okay? So I've listed some, of course, people thinking, you know, bourgeois cultures or, or institution in terms of the Industrial Revolution, same kind of stuff for, um, you know, the, 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 the rise of uh, Western Europe after 1500, so the, um, the growth of the countries which have access to Atlantic Ocean. This is interesting, right? There's a, there's a fundamental, um, you know, can I say, identification question here if you think about causality in the sense that 
uh, you know, the, the countries which grew, grew so okay, so in, after 1500s, uh, some countries started to grow much more than the rest of the world, and the countries who grew much more were the countries which had access to the, to the Atlantic Oceans for obvious reasons. Um, now, between those countries, five countries, basically, Britain, France, the Netherlands, Portugal, and Spain, between those countries, the countries which really grew uh, were, um, were Britain and the Netherlands, okay? Well, and, 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 you know, the, the Protestant countries. In the other, on, the other, on the other dimension, these were also countries which had, in a measurable, relatively well measurable way, better institutions, okay? So now, is it culture, is it institution? My point is I don't care, I want to understand the, the interaction, okay? Um, another, of course, example that I, uh, it's very, I'm, I'm very fond of is, the, is what Italians call the questione meridionale, the issue of the north and the south, the, the enormous difference between the north and the south, very large difference between the north and the south in terms of, of uh, uh, prosperity and, you know, the fact that these two regions in the country have very difficult, very different uh, historical uh, experiences, okay? So which kind of a, I have a, just a, a few minutes, which kind of a model do we have, what we can do with it? So no equation, huh? Um, so w what we can do with this, so we are, we are thinking very abstractly. So this is just to give you a sense of how um, uh, economists do these things, or, or we, or bad economists do these things. So, um, so there's a society, uh, it's populated by different groups of agents. Let's think two groups to be, to make simple. These agents have different cultural traits, okay? So for some reason, uh, they're different, different technologies. And then, you know, there's a government, and the government plays a game in the sense that the government sets the policy, sets policy variables that are relevant uh, for the agents in the economy uh, to make choices. And how does the government choose? Well, the government is, is good. He's maximizing some social welfare, but the social welfare depends on, the, the, the social welfare contains the welfare of two different groups which are different. So the relative power, institutions to us, the way we model institution is the relative power the, of the different groups in the um, social welfare, which in turn determines uh, the policy of the government, okay? So a, a government run by aristocrats will only care about aristocrats or mostly care about aristocrats, a government, uh, of the working class will care about the working class and will hurt uh, the aristocrats, okay? So that, that's kind of the idea. So that's what we mean by institution. Uh, what we mean by culture is the cultural traits of these groups in the population. And then we have, you know, uh, assumptions or, 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 or theories about how these things change and move. And here the idea is that um, the, the, the stuff on culture, you know, Thierry and I have been, work for, have been working on this for many years, and, and I care a little bit less about, but culture, uh, in the sense that I'm bored, uh, culture moves, um, uh, so moves due to uh, socialization decisions, so parents decide to, you know, push the, uh, the culture of the kids, and this, of course, depends on how, you know, you don't push the, I don't push, uh, the culture of my son if that culture uh, means that he's going to be killed tomorrow, okay? So there are incentives that parents take into account when they decide how to socialize the kids. And the most important part, maybe because it's a little bit newer, is, the, is how institutions evolve. And here the idea is institutions here are evolving to internalize distortions um, in the policy game, right? So it, this does not mean that in equilibrium we're gonna have efficient stuff, but institutions are trying to internalize um, uh, inefficiencies in, 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 in the economy. Uh, and, and, so, and, and uh, so an institution, the institutional change looks like a, a delegation mechanism in many instances. The, the idea, the, 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 the example that uh, it's clearer is, again, think of aristocrats and workers, and think of a world where you know, the aristocrats can, are in charge um, and they can tax workers. Okay, so the aristocrats can tax workers um, at, at a very high rate, and this means effectively that the workers are not working because they're gonna be taxed like crazy. And suppose the aristocrats cannot make them work and only tax them. So the aristocrats will tax workers like crazy, the workers don't work, the aristocrats don't make any money, and the workers starve. This is a very inefficient world. So in this environment, maybe the aristocrats would like to give the workers a parliament, a sort of a commitment device where in the parliament, you know, the workers, uh, will be able to limit the amount of taxes. If this happening, it might be better for both. 
The aristocrats and the worker. The worker will work a little bit more, but they get more money because they're not taxed too much, and the aristocrats get money because they can tax the world. So that's the story. This is the dynamics, okay? So we put together these two, of course, of course, um, the, the dynamics of institution depends on the distribution of culture, depends on how many worker and how many aristocrats there are in this society, right? So, uh, and how much the aristocrats and the worker want to socialize uh, their kids to their culture depends on whether, you know, the kids are going to be taxed like crazy so they're, 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 uh, they're starving or not. So the whole, this is all, the whole interaction. Uh, Q&A, I guess this means I'm done. Um, so, so, okay, so that's the story. Uh, I, so look at the equation. That's the, that's the dynamics. Um, so this is it's completely relevant, of course, as you understand here uh, in this talk. Um, I, I would like to think it's not in, in general, but in this talk it is. I'm, I'm closing. It's, ju it's just a way of saying, uh, just a way of, you know, conveying this idea that you can build all these things that I talked about into relatively simple um, mathematical equations that you can, uh, you can study. And if I had uh, 10 more minutes, I would tell you what happens. Um, so, um, of course, what, okay, so let me finish. Um, let me tell you what we can do. Okay, so a couple of, oh, so let me say just two things. Um, the, 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 so if I, I write down that equation, I study it, and I don't have time to say uh, uh, what, can, what I get out, and I'm happy because <laughs> there's not that much that I can get out. But um, what's important here is something that I tried to convey before, which is everything about, everything that I can say about this equation in an interesting way depends on whether culture and institution are complements or substitutes, okay? So, by complements, as I, as, I meant, as I said before, is when, suppose institution goes up, whatever up means, suppose the institution changes up, um, then, the, then what happens to culture? Does it go up? And if culture goes up, what happens to, to institution? It goes up too. If up, 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 that's complement, okay? If when institution goes up, culture goes down, uh, or the other way around, then um, you can have substitution, okay? So then culture and, and and, uh, and uh, institution work against each other, okay? So, uh, so it's not just the size of the effect. Of course, any effect, any change, it's bigger if the, if culture and institution are, are complements, then it's substitute, but it's not just that. Everything interesting about the dynamics, for instance, the possibility of having cycles, uh, okay? Situation where the aristocrats are in power and then go down and then go up and then go down. So things of this sort, cycles of this sort, all depends, can, they can only happen in case of substitution. So all depends on this um, cultural complementarity versus uh, substitutability, okay? So in some sense, that's, uh, that's the way, uh, that's how I want to finish. So the way we, uh, not that I want to finish, they have to finish. Um, so the, the way, I have a bunch of examples. Uh, so the way these models look like at the end, you write down things like that. You see those arrows, they'll tell you where things go. Uh, on the beta is institution, Q is culture, whatever this means. When you change one, you change the other. Here, in this example, I wanted to talk about this example because there are two um, final steady states, two final endpoints of the dynamics, and depending on where you start, you where you start, you get to either one or the other. Okay, um, back to history. Thank you. I know there's lunch, and oh, by the way, I, I, and I know you can ask me Raquel's question, the question you want to ask Raquel. I'll, I'll answer them, but. So, uh, about, about, let, yeah. me, uh, let me first um, agree, uh, and this is really a comment about all the papers, that this is, I think, where the action is. I'm agreeing with your kind of interpretation of you know, what our thinking on these big issues. I think that's exactly right. Um, the other thing I want to do is just make some plugs for some books of history that I found useful. One is um, Freedom and Fairness by Hackett Fisher, uh, who, who looks at basically kind of the effects of different founding populations and then political uh, discourse in New Zealand versus the United States. But I think the really interesting one uh, is The Chosen Few by Baraccini and uh, Zvi Eckstein, because it, and your language is actually helping me rethink how I describe that book. So it's an instance of a cultural shock that leads to higher literacy amongst the Jews. So it's similar to kind of the shock model that um, 
Raquel was talking about as well. But then what they capture really nicely is this interaction between education and institutions, where in this case it's cleaner because the institutions are determined outside of the control of the small group of the, of the Jews. So you have institutions that facilitate trade, you get urbanization, then human capital turns out to be very valuable, but then you know, the institutional regime collapses, cities collapse, it's, it's not so valuable to be, uh, uh, to, to be literate. So it's, uh, I think, a great historical account that you know, kind of illustrates the things you're talking about. Um, I, uh, I, I've done some research, and I think uh, you mentioned urban centers being an issue, but it's the competition and cooperation between the two major urban centers. New York and Chicago, I think, have defined what America is and, and its progress. Using some examples, FDR wanted to defeat the, imp the Depression. He had the Buffalo Plan, which was originally the Chicago Plan, which was to use barter and different flexible means of moving merchandise to defeat the Depression. He, of course, was nominated in Chicago at the convention. But then you have skyscrapers start in Chicago, they come to New York. You get Chicago University educational policy, Hutchins, Milton Friedman economics, this is what it is. So I think that that's, that's a dynamic, working competitive and cooperation that makes for a great nation. The problem with Canada is it has no Chicago. Montreal is great by itself. Toronto is great by itself. One has a different tradition. French, yeah, they don't work together. And that's why America's America and Toronto's Toronto. Thanks for, uh, apart from uh, we'll let Nathan talk about Canada. Uh, so, um, no, no, of course I agree. I mean, I don't know, I don't know uh, as much about New York and Chicago. Oh, sorry. I don't know enough about uh, New York to Chicago. Um, but but a, a lot of the history that, you know, I've been reading for this is actually, um, it's actually about uh, cities in the Middle Age and the Renaissance in Italy, okay? So the free, free city-states and the whole, there, the whole, um, so, the, so I'm not sure if the, so the, the interaction between them is crucial. Now, I'm not really sure whether it's cooperation or competition, it depends on, you know, whatever they're doing, uh, depending on, in some sense, on the environment, the kind of economic system that they are in. Sometimes competition between them uh, works uh, rather than, than cooperation. And, and in some instances in Italy, certainly that's what was happening. But, uh, but, uh, but I completely agree that, uh, you know, this, this uh, so it goes back to you know, endogenous growth. So cities are crucial in this. One of the, uh, I was saying before, uh, um, the, uh, um, that there's a lot of work in terms of collecting historical data. Some of this, uh, actually, some of the people are in this room doing it in Italy, um, are, are actually really collecting data on uh, cities, on polities, so the institutional structure of cities in Italy, in Europe more generally, but Italy, you know, it's kind of crucial. It's a perfect lab for this kind of stuff. So, um, yeah, I completely sympathize with the comment, though I don't know much. Uh, I love Chicago, but that's all. I would like to ask a question on a specific time frame from 1990 and into the future to 2030. And as you were making your lecture, I was thinking of the fact that Northern Europe has had solid economic growth since 1990 to the present, whereas Italy, since the 1990s, it has almost zero economic growth. And what explains this? How much of this is culture? and how much of this is institutions? Okay, so very good question, and you can imagine it's a question that I've been thinking about a lot, though not with the, not with the I mean, in the context of these models, but uh, so the simple answer is A, total factor productivity in Italy and even labor productivity has been completely flat for 30 years, where it's grown every, essentially everywhere else in the, in the West, okay? So if you look at Italy and Germany, in terms of total factor productivity, I mean, it's, 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 it's scary, okay? So, uh, as we started this, this lecture in this sense, what is it, uh, what's A, okay? So, in this short, you know, in, in 50 years, um, I don't think culture, uh, okay, so 
It's not obvious that cultural institutions are, are an obvious, I mean, they are perhaps, but as a, as, you know, as a, a legacy of the past, okay? So there is no, uh, the, the, in terms of factors dr driving uh, the low growth of, of total factor productivity in Italy, okay? So Italy is, yeah, I mean, I don't know that. Uh, Italy is a, is a country which, is, which has got all sorts of problems in terms of policy, a political institution, uh, culturally, again, it goes back to the north and south, culturally very divided. Uh, this implies very complicated, you know, uh, the, the government now is essentially handing out uh, different things in the north and in the south, but it's still handing out uh, stuff. Um, and of course, this impacts on the efficiency of growth. So, uh, yeah, I don't know that, I, would, I don't know that, um, I would want to go into, is it cultural institution in this case? I don't know that I want to do that. Maybe over lunch. And over the next uh, 10 years? I mean, the way it's going, it's very, I mean, I, as I think many economists, we, we don't like to make prediction, that, at least not predictions that can be falsified. So I'm not going to make any prediction that can be falsified. Uh, I am very pessimistic. I mean, the, the situation in the country now is crazy. I mean, now, by now, I mean 20 minutes ago, it was crazy, okay? So um, they're talking about um, financial repressions very openly. Uh, so, I mean, yeah, so they're talking about going out of the euro. So, yeah, I'm not, you know, I can't be. Uh, so for the next 40 minutes, very pessimistic. In the last 10 years, I don't know. I'm... I'm, I'm finished. Let's go for lunch. Thank you.